Okay, everyone, welcome to session two, um, where we'll be discussing um, current and pending clinical trials and observational studies in craniofrenioma. Um, joining us today is Dr. Todd Hankinson. Um, he will be going first, followed by Dr. Kathy Klein and Dr. Julia Crowley. Um, just a reminder, we'll be taking questions at the end of the session. You can put your questions in the chat and we'll read them off to the presenters. Or you may raise your hand using the um, raise hand feature in Zoom and we'll call on you if you want to ask the presenters your questions directly. We have um, we do have live translation services via Wordly and that has been activated. If you have any trouble um, accessing that, please let us know. Um, so first off, we have Dr. Chan Hedkinson. He's a native of Albuquerque, New Mexico. He completed his undergraduate degree in political science in Spanish at Middlebury College in Vermont. He then start, spent a year working in oncology department at New York University, conducting clinical trials in malignant mel melanoma. Dr. Hankinson has completed both medical school and neurosurgery residency training at the Neurological Institute of New York, Columbia University. He then proceeded to complete subspecialty training in pediatric neurosurgery at Children's Hospital of Alabama. During medical school, Dr. Hankinson also completed a Master's of Business Administration at the University of Oxford, and he is now Division Head for Pediatric Neurosurgery at Children's Hospital Colorado and the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Dr. Hankinson's clinical and re research interests include the surgical management of central nervous system tumors. He leads advancing treatment for pediatric craniopharyngioma, a multi-center North American consortium that shares tissue and clinical data for research into the biology and outcomes of childhood craniopharyngioma. His laboratory studies the basic biology of craniopharyngioma with a focus on translating that information into clinic use. They have developed novel culture models and helped describe the transcriptional and inflammatory, inflammatory features of craniopharyngioma. He collaborates closely with colleagues in Europe and throughout North America. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Hankinson. Thank you. Thanks, Amy, and thank, thank you everybody for being here and for inviting me. And um, hopefully this will provide a little bit of information on sort of where we are right now with clinical trials and, um, and Cassie has a lot of great information too. And uh, it's a really exciting moment right now for clinical trials in cranio because frankly, we really haven't had much in the future and in the past, I mean, and now we're just sort of starting to get some ramped up here and hopefully that'll help us build more for the future as well. And also help reveal some effective, better therapies for our patients. So just, this will probably be about 25 minutes or so, maybe maybe a little bit more. And so I'll just talk a little bit about like some basic clinical stuff. I know a lot of people are, are very familiar with that already, so I won't spend too much time. And then uh, touch on some of the biological characteristics of these tumors, only because I think it's important in terms of understanding how we got to the trials that were uh, starting up soon and then talk in a little bit more detail about the trials themselves. So people know that craniopharyngioma, while it's a histologically benign tumor, meaning that it grows slowly and it's not considered um, an aggressive cancer, uh, it's still a very harmful and difficult tumor to treat. And it's relatively uncommon, but it's still the most common tumor that we see in children in the pituitary region, so in the, the skull base. And you kind of have two age groups that get craniopharyngioma, one being kids who are, um, you know, the range can be anywhere, but five to 15 is the biggest spike, but then a second one in adults, and that's important and relevant for um, some of the things that <clears throat> I'll mention later on. But most importantly, craniopharyngioma elicits uh, really severe sequelae. So the quality of life can really be affected by some of the things that craniopharyngioma does to our brains. And so it's really important for us to come up with better therapies to try to combat that. And right now, therapies are really limited to surgery and radiation. And this is not a slide people need to memorize, but uh, those treatments have been around for a long time and they've gotten better, but they're still not great. And the outcomes still show high recurrence rates. You know, after surgery alone, it can be almost 50%. Even after radiation, it can be one in three. And so that's just not good enough. And unfortunately, we have not had any therapies that are really based on the biology of these tumors. And the background of that is complex, but it has to do with the fact that 
not being that common. Uh, people don't have not in the past had a lot of tissue to study. And then also being considered a benign tumor or a low grade lesion, people were less inclined and funders were less inclined to investigate these tumors. And so it took a lot of uh, activation energy to sort of get over the hump to really start to develop some momentum for the study of the biology of these tumors. But I think now uh, with a lot of collaboration from people, you know, all over the country and really all over the world, we've, we've gotten there. And that's why it's a pretty exciting moment in terms of new therapies. So I'm not going to do this too much. I don't know if people have had lunch, but those are just all the different surgical ways we can approach these things just to express the fact that there's a lot of ways and everybody's tumor is unique. And we need to think about that. And people have tried everything we can from a surgical standpoint. And that's why, you know, my colleagues get mad at me that I'm putting us out of business by trying to come up with ways to treat these without surgery, but I just think that it's, it's better. Um, and so what we started with, which Amy mentioned, was we created a small uh, consortium back in 2015, and it's grown a little bit. And this is a pretty bare bones basic thing, but the idea is to take tumor tissue and clinical experience from kids all over the place and bring it together so that it's easier for us to really have focused investigation of the biology of these tumors and how children do with different approaches, different therapies, what their quality of life outcomes are. And that can help us form the basis for new drugs and new investigations for ways we can get better therapies. If we if we don't understand the biology, we can't come up with better therapies. And we were having trouble understanding the biology because no one place saw enough of these cases to really study it. So that was the impetus behind putting together a consortium where basically people just send in tissue and we share clinical information and then try to learn things based on that. Unfortunately, that has been, um, has been pretty successful thus far. Again, though, it's still pretty basic. So some of the biological things that we've found because of this, and I'm not going to belabor the biology too much, but I think there are a couple of things that are just important important to understand. And one is just the message from this slide is just craniopharyngioma is really unique because it's really heterogeneous, which is to say there's a lot of different cell types. There's a lot of signaling going on. It's not just one big ball of cells that are growing out of control. It's this really coordinated orchestra of bad biology that's going on and understanding how that communication happens, understanding the role of each different cell type is going to really help us um, develop new therapies. And so it's really important to understand that that's where we have to come from. And that's where we've been coming from when it comes to uh, coming up with, with new treatments and the bases for the trials that we're starting up. And so this is just a quick summary of some of the, the basic research that, that led to these trials. And I'll talk about it a little bit more, but basically looking at the, the transcriptome just basically means the mRNA of these tumors, which is to say little small signaling molecules that the cells use to tell themselves or each other what to manufacture, what small proteins or what things to make, and that influences cell behavior. So the, the rationale is if we understand what signals the cells are sending to themselves and to the other things around them, then maybe we can understand what the vulnerable pieces of this tumor are, and then we can get into blocking those things. One of the things that we stumbled upon in Colorado was the fact that craniopharyngiomas express super high levels of a really well-known signaling molecule called IL-6. And um, it turns out that there are therapies that really nicely target that, that um, molecule and also that have been used previously in both kids and adults. And so it created a really fortunate situation where we actually had a drug that we had experience with that we felt like targeted this particular feature pretty nicely. Uh, that being said, it was still a pretty basic finding. And so, um, but that is partially the basis for one of the trials that we're doing. Similarly, um, some of our colleagues did some work that showed that a specific pathway that's really well known in cancer called the MAP kinase ERK pathway or MAPK ERK, which you can see highlighted here, uh, is also activated in these tumors when, when you look at both human tumors and they did some work with mice. And uh, the group at NYU, um, based on some of this information, actually treated a patient with a medication that targets this pathway uh, and showed you know, a decent little response in a patient who had had really, really difficult to treat disease. So you had a little bit of biology and a little bit of clinical information that sort of helped support this idea. And also, again, you had agents with which we as a clinical community had a lot of experience and comfort with in terms of things that we could use to try to leverage this information. 
I just wanted to make one point here, which is some work that we did looking again at those little signaling molecules, showing that on a basic level, the tumors that you see in kids are quite similar to the ones you see in adults. And I just wanted to make that point because I think it's important to know that what we find in the kids who are the primary basis of our research may also apply nicely to adults, at least on a basic level. And that's really important because the adults who get afflicted with these tumors suffer a lot as well. And it would be really great if we could translate that information across age groups. So one other important um, finding that really formed the basis of the trial that Cassie is going to talk about is something called program cell death protein one or PD-1. And it's basically a molecule that is involved in multiple cancers and is involved in blocking the immune system from fighting against tumor cells. And what uh, the group primarily in Boston, and we worked with them a little bit on this, found is that craniopharyngiomas express both the molecule and what the molecule binds with in very specific patterns, but it was expressed in pretty high levels relative to other tumors that we looked at, which again made us think that maybe craniopharyngioma um, is something where this is a particular vulnerability because it's uniquely expressed in terms of its level compared to even other types of tumors. And so this helped form the basis for uh, the, the trial that uh, Cassie will talk mostly about, specifically with regard to a drug called nivolumab. So just super quick summary of the biology, ignore that top part. It's just to say that um, without talking about it specifically today, the biggest actually biological feature of these tumors that's known is there's a really specific mutation in the DNA that's not in, um, there's no other mutations. Uh, it's just this one, but we just don't have really good ways to target that right now. So we have to work around it. And I wanted people to know that there is a lot of biology with these tumors that we don't understand yet that we're still working on, despite the fact that we're also trying to translate things as quickly as we can into actual trials. But using the information that I just described, this is kind of how we came to look at the agents that we are interested in trying. So I'm going to talk about a trial using tocilizumab, which is a drug that specifically blocks IL-6 signaling. Um, Cassie will talk about tovarafenib or day 101, and I'll talk a little bit about benimetinib. Those both target that um, MAP kinase ERK pathway. And then Cassie will talk a little more about nivolumab, which is a, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, but it targets that, that PD-1 molecule. So in terms of the details of the trials, if you just kind of look at the big list of trials that's available um, in the US right now, in terms of, and this, there's a lot of really cool work that's going on in craniopharyngioma in general with regard to things like, how do we treat hypothalamic injury better? or how do we coordinate radiation and surgery? There, and that work is super important and, and it's, it's an active area. When it comes to things that are saying like, hey, what are new agents that target the biology of these tumors? There's not that much going on right now. And so up until you know, effectively now, we've just had these two little tiny things that, that we've been doing in Colorado and they're great and they've been informative, but it's not of the scale and detail and sophistication that we really need to advance treatment. And so by the time um, Cassie and I are done, you'll have a little bit more information about the specific trials that should be opening relatively soon that are multi-center international trials that should hopefully help us get a much better idea of whether or not some of these drugs can, can help our patients. So first to talk about how we got to the trial using what's called tocilizumab, which is the IL-6 blocker. One thing that's important that some people may be familiar with, some may not, is that the central nervous system, and in this case, the brain in particular, is in a privileged area relative to the rest of the body, which is to say that certain molecules are blocked from passing from the bloodstream into the area immediately around the brain. And that's almost certainly a protective mechanism. But what it does is it can prevent some medications that we think are important to give to areas around the brain from getting there if you give them into the bloodstream. Tocilizumab is a large molecule that when you just look at biology, shouldn't be able to get across that barrier from the bloodstream into the brain. Um, but we had some information I'll talk about in a second that made us think that maybe uh, in craniopharyngioma, it could get across. And so in order to start a clinical trial, we had to 
first take a look and make sure that that was the case and make sure that the drug actually gets to the tumors because otherwise you're just giving it into people's bloodstream and doing nothing. So that trial is called a phase zero trial, which is basically just seeing if drug gets to the target when you give it in the course of normal therapy. Well, it doesn't have to be for normal therapy, but in this case it was. So what we started with was patients who needed surgery for craniopharyngioma. We gave them one dose of the drug just before their surgery. And then when we took the tumor out, we analyzed it to see if we could find the drug in the tumor or in the cystic component of the tumor. So there's a solid part and a cystic part. So we did that and we said, okay, we're going to do that in up to five patients. And if we can see that the drug is there in three or more, then we're going to move the trial on to what's called a feasibility portion, which is to say that we know it gets there. Now we want to see if kids can actually tolerate it, if it has any effect at all, if the plan will work. And so Eric Prince, whose picture is here, helped um, analyze and study these results. And what we found is when we gave the drug to the first three patients, all three of them had measurable drug either in the tumor or the cyst. Now, this wasn't like a total complete home run, but because um, there was some variability. So what you can sort of see in these two things on the left is these are control patients who didn't get the drug. So obviously you wouldn't see any of the drug in the tumor itself or in the cyst. But in the first patient, you saw a pretty high level of drug in the tumor and then a little bit in the cyst. In the second patient, there was just a little bit in the tumor, in the tumor and hardly any in the cyst. And in the third one, there was hardly any in the tumor and a lot in the cyst. So while it gets there, it's not like at the exact same levels that it is in the blood. It's much lower. So there's some filtering going on and it's not totally consistent. So, you know, we took that as, okay, it gets there and we should move forward because it's important, but there are other things we may need to think about down the road. And those are still open questions. So it's important to, to know that um, the blood brain barrier is not totally gone, but it's certainly not totally competent. And that has implications for other drugs that we may want to use down the future in the future um, that we think would not otherwise get across the blood-brain barrier. So I mentioned that we had some indication that the drug may get there, and that was because we had treated a couple of kids on a compassionate use basis with TOSI and had seen responses to their cystic tumors. And so these weren't super dramatic. This big shift down size in the size of the cyst was not from the drug. That was from surgery. Um, but after receiving tocilizumab, both of these kids had cysts that had been problematic that ceased being problematic. They didn't disappear. Oh, well, one of them did actually, but, but they settled down. So we had that biology data and we had that clinical data, similarly to what we had with the MEK inhibition, where we had the biology data from the group in London, and then we had that patient who had been treated in New York. And so we had all that information to sort of go with to try to build a trial. So at that point, we said, okay, well, how can we build a trial? Who can we work with? Um, because I am not a clinical trialist. And I will tell you what I have learned in this process is clinical trials are super complicated and super hard to build and it takes forever and it's really difficult. And you need someone like um, Cassie, Fatima, I don't know if Julia does clinical trials, who actually knows what they're doing because I don't. So we, um, we went to a group called Connect. And the reason was that you know, we had done a lot of the early work in Colorado um, but we had worked really closely with a group at, at Great Ormond Street or University College London, um, and Connect was a group to which both of us were members. So it was really nice because uh, we could both contribute and be be involved. And also, um, Connect is is really good at doing early trials. What they've focused on in the past is trials for really malignant aggressive tumors, but early trials that are meant to be um, relatively small and move efficiently to try to see if there is safety and some efficacy in new drugs being used for, for certain tumors. And so it was kind of a nice mesh of what we were trying to accomplish because we're doing this a little bit on a shoestring budget um, and who the members of the group were. So uh, Connect is run by Miriam Fulati, whose picture is here on the left, and she's based at Nationwide Children's now. Katie Doris on the right, she's uh, the neuro-oncologist at Colorado who has really been leading the sort of clinical trials piece of this, and, and she and I work really closely together. And so we went to them with the idea of doing a trial that included tocilizumab and included what's called a MEK inhibitor. So that's something that blocks that MAP kinase pathway called binimetinib. And they actually thought it was a cool idea. So we got to work on, on how to make it happen. 
So what ended up happening is the drug companies weren't super excited to work together and combine the agents in a, in a specific patient. And that's one of the things that I think that um, the trial that Cassie will talk about is really great that they're able to do that. We weren't able to do that with this. And, and so that disappointed me a little bit. But so what we're doing is we have two basically parallel, almost identical trials, one of each drug. And then the hope is that we're going to be able to do a combination on the back end. So this trial called 1905 is a trial of tocilizumab, which is the IL-6 receptor inhibitor drug that I mentioned. Um, that has been used really widely in rheumatoid arthritis and also in some children who have a specific type of response after they get what's called CAR T-cell therapy for, um, for cancers. So even in the pediatrics world, we have a lot of experience with that drug. People may have heard about it because it's been used for inflammation in the context of COVID as well. Uh, and that actually slowed us down quite a bit because of drug availability. But um, the first trial is that one. And it's always been a little bit ahead. We just got it started a little bit faster than the second one. Uh, but it's moving along. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the details in a minute. The second one is called 2108. And that's basically the exact same trial, only it's using a uh, what's called a MEK inhibitor. Again, a type of drug that we have a lot of experience with in pediatric neuro oncology. Um, and this is there are multiple MEK inhibitors. This one is called binimetinib. So the patients who are eligible for these studies are identical. So I'm only going to talk about it in the context of one. So it's anybody who is older than a year and less than 25 years who has craniopharyngioma uh, with, with disease that we can see on an MRI scan. So if you have your tumor completely taken out, then you're not eligible for the study. And complete removal of these tumors is really one of the mainstays of treatment. Like as a surgeon, if I feel like it's safe to take one out, I will always try to do that, almost always try to do that. But it's just happens all too often that we're not able to do that. We're not able to do it safely. And that's where these things come into play. So if there are two groups of patients on this study. One are those who have already received radiation treatment. The other are those who have not. And it's important for us to analyze those two groups separately because we think that the biology of what's happening with the tumor is almost certainly affected by the radiation treatment that someone receives if they receive it. And therefore, we need to look at those two groups separately. So each of these groups, based on the biostats that we did with estimating the effect of drug and things like that, will have 19 patients in it roughly. So you're talking about 40 total across all these sites uh, in, in North America, in Europe, and, and in Australia. The way that the trial works is tocilizumab, as I mentioned, is an intravenous drug. So you have to ha have an IV to receive it. So patients come in once every two weeks. It usually takes about a half a day in the outpatient setting. So they go home afterwards. They don't stay in the hospital, but they come in, they get their medication. We watch and make sure they're doing okay. And then they go home and you just do that once every two weeks for up to two years. With the binimetinib trial, it's slightly different because that's an oral drug. So that's just a pill that you can take at home. That has really good things and really bad things about it. The good ones are obvious. You don't have to come to the hospital. You don't have to get an IV. You can be you know, potentially far away from the hospital that is running the trial. The downside is we're dealing with young children a lot of the time who may not be really excited about taking pills or may not be able to take pills. They're already getting a lot of medical treatment. And so just the logistics of it can be really difficult. So the, the pill piece of it is a strength and a weakness, depending upon uh, your particular circumstances. Um, and so one of these is an IV therapy and one of them is an oral therapy. Again, this is a two-year study. And with the binimetinib, you basically just take a pill twice a day, every day. And this is just talking about what the dosing is, which is pretty well established. So how are we going to determine whether or not what we're doing is actually working and whether it's helping? And there are there are two ways we're going to do that. And this, I think, is um, this this trial is, I think, a little bit more streamlined and basic than the PNOC trial, which I think is like I would love for it to actually have some of the parameters that the PNOC trial is going to have. Um, but I think since we were we were trying to do this in a little bit more of sort of a, an, an expedited way, um, we're mainly going to be looking at radiographic parameters as opposed to like looking at quality of life outcomes. So we're going to look at MRI scans and you don't have to memorize the table on the side, but it's just an example. So 
based um, at specific time points, we'll look and see, has the tumor responded? Has the cystic portion responded? Has the solid portion responded um, or not? And based on that in combination with how the patient is doing, that will determine whether or not you continue on the study or whether or not you come off the study. What we are also gonna do is have any specimens that are um, removed because patients need surgery around the margins of going on or coming off the study. We're gonna send those, they're either gonna to come to my lab if the patient is in North America or Australia, or they're gonna to go to my collaborator whose photo is here. His name's Juan Pedro Martinez Barbera. He's the one who's led the work in England. So European specimens are gonna to go to his lab. And then we've agreed upon a set of assays of studies that we're gonna do on that tissue to try to see if we can identify the effect or lack of effect that the drug may have had on the tissue that it was, it was treating. So that'll help us understand biologically, and maybe we'll be able to correlate that with how children have done how children have done clinically as well. So where are we? I've sort of mentioned this a little bit, but um, both of these studies have taken longer to get up and running than we had hoped, which I think is a really common theme in research in general and in clinical trials. Um, so the regulatory approvals have been obtained for both, and they are out now at all the different sites or around. Uh, around the world for the regulatory processes at those institutions to be completed and done. So there are legal processes, there are medical regulatory processes that have to happen. Both of them, the drug companies have agreed to give us the medications and have them you know, packaged in places where they can just send them out when we need them. So that piece of it is all done. So we're really hoping that the tocilizumab study will open as soon as January. And that the binimetinib study will open within a couple of months after that. But um, I've become a little more cynical in this recently, so I'll, uh, I'll believe it when I see it. But that is kind of, we've been making some progress lately, and that's the hope of, of where we're going to be here. And then Cassie will talk more about, um, about the PNOC trial, but I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it because it's been actually really fun to work with Cassie and, and Fatima Mulbari, who's also pictured here from PNOC in terms of um, designing and putting this study together and talking about some of the biological things that um, are important and that we're going to investigate with regard to, uh, to that study as well. And one last point I wanted to make, which I think is really important, is we're in this really cool, exciting moment where all of a sudden we're actually going to have some biologically rational trials that we're going to do, and hopefully we're going to have something that we can deliver to patients and families that will be an improvement. But it's really unlikely that we're gonna cure this tumor with our first try with, with these trials. You know, this, is, this is a step along the way almost for sure. And it's really important for us to know that there are a whole host of biological parameters and unique pathways um, and characteristics of these tumors that we have not taken as far as we have gone with regard to IL-6 inhibition, MEK inhibition, checkpoint inhibition. And there's more we can do with those pathways as well. But I just wanted to mention that um, there is um, a big bullpen of potential agents and pathways that we still have to explore and try to identify whether or not those may be equally good, better, or supplementary um, interventions that we can make with regard to these tumors as well. So I think there's a lot of work still left to do, certainly clinically, but also biologically with regard to these things. Um, and that's kind of the basic summary. You know, we're at the point now where clinical trials will hopefully start to swing a little bit the traditional treatment mechanisms that we've had in place, which have just been surgery and radiation. And uh, I'm obviously super excited about that. And then I just wanted to thank um, a ton of people who have been involved with both uh, the consortium, the ATPC, but also um, with all of the stuff that we do. It's everything we do is a huge group effort with a lot of overlap and input from tons and tons of people. And, um, and I just want to make sure that, that everyone's very well aware of that. And um, that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tad, very much. And I just, we are going to take questions at the end, but I just wanted to share a comment. Michelle says, love this data. Thanks for sharing, Dr. Hankinton. So this was great. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Dr. Cassie Klein. Uh, Dr. Klein is the Director of Clinical Research for Neuro-Oncology within the Division of Oncology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. 
She specializes in the care of children, adolescents, and young adults with a brain and spinal cord tumors of all types. She has a master's of advanced studies in clinical research and focuses her career on early phase clinical trials and developmental therapeutics for pediatric brain tumor patients. Dr. Klein's other research interests include predictors of neurocognitive outcomes in pediatric brain tumor survivors and personalized and immunotherapy-based approaches for the treatment of brain tumors. Additionally, Dr. Klein serves as the Director of Data Quality and Integration for PNOC, overseeing the consortium's data collection processes, and also integration across a variety of data platforms and research collaborations. We are also honored to have her as a member of the Raymond A. Wood Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. Without further ado, Dr. Klein. Thank you so much, Amy. And um, as I'm getting started, just apologies to the audience. I'm recovering from a bad case of laryngitis and um, it was a little touch and go if I was gonna be able to give the talk today, but I'm gonna try to push through because it's really important, I think, to be able to speak to you all and share the work that Todd is doing and that we're doing and Julia's doing. And, um, you know, I'll start out, of course, by saying thank you for having us, but also just to really echo what Todd said and that it's been in a really exciting couple of years for us. And I think we've come together across uh, institutions, uh, across countries and continents in ways that we haven't been able to do historically to help figure out ways in which we're advancing the treatments for children and young adults with craniopharyngioma. And additionally, I think we're coming together in ways not previously done in terms of thinking ahead of time, how we wanna collect our data, our tissues, how we wanna develop our preclinical models and bring this together all in a complementary fashion so that none of us are working in silos and we're not duplicating things, but that we're synergizing and adding to each other's data and information so that five years from now, as Todd described, we're exponentially farther than where we are today in bringing better therapies and finding you know, curative uh, options for these patients, but with positive impact on quality of life, and functional outcomes, which is really imperative as you all very well know. So I will focus my talk on our clinical trial that we've developed within the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium using nivolumab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor, and tovarafenib, which is what's called a PAN-RAF inhibitor. And we'll be bringing those drugs together for the treatment of both patients with newly diagnosed or recurrent craniopharyngioma. So this work has been the result of a substantial multidisciplinary and multi-institutional clinical trial team. These are four collaborators here, but this has certainly been the work of broad reaching um, scientific and um, biological input. And so I will highlight four critical team members here. Um, Dr. Jay Storm, the chief of neurosurgery here at CHOP, Dr. Nalan Gupta, Gupta, the chief of neurosurgery at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, Dr. Shana McCormick, um, who's the scientific director of our neuroendocrine center here at CHOP, and then Dr. Robert Avery, who's one of our lead ophthalmologists here at CHOP. And I highlight this team because I think it is unique in craniopharyngioma, the multidisciplinary expertise that is required to really make sure we're providing and discovering the best therapies for our patients because we want our patients to have the best neurosurgical outcomes, to have the best neuroendocrine outcomes, to have the best neuroophthalmology outcomes. And so those outcomes really have to be informed by a unique group of specialists in this field. So none of this work could be done um, without the expertise of these leaders. So I just really wanna highlight that and the significance um, as patients and families are seeking care for their, their children and their, their loved ones, that the, the care for these tumors really do require um, the input of experts across a number of different fields. And so we all need to be thoughtful of that. And so Todd did a beautiful job giving a bit of background of craniopharyngioma. I will not spend a lot of time um, repeating what he already expertly uh, presented to you all. But I will just briefly echo what he said about historically that craniopharyngioma has been thought of as a pediatric and an adult subtype. And so the pediatric subtype tends to be this adamantinomonous craniopharyngioma, and the adult subtype tends to be enriched with this papillary craniopharyngioma. 
What is interesting is that, as Todd also mentioned, we're discovering more and more overlaps between what we thought were potentially two unique entities of craniopharyngioma. And I think that will inform how we're treating these diseases in a more comprehensive way and in a far reaching setting and allow us also to take information from pediatric experts and from adult experts all over the globe to figure out how we can improve care. However, to date, the predominant approach for these tumors remains a surgical resection and then radiation therapy if there's residual or recurrent disease. And certainly when the disease comes back, particularly if the patient has already been irradiated and already had surgery, the options are more and more limited. And unfortunately, the disease and the surgeries and the radiation itself can come together to create really, really challenging outcomes for these patients. So they suffer from, as you all are well aware, vision loss, hypopituitarism, hypothalamic injury and syndrome, um, hypothalamic obesity. And then for the patients that have radiation too, we have a real risk for stroke from the vascular injury that happens from the radiation. We have a risk for cognitive impairment as well from radiation and from all of the other constellation of injuries these patients suffer from. And so because of that, We've really been motivated to figure out how we can better treat these patients and perhaps using approaches that are more targeted and prevent some of these negative consequences. And so a lot of this work, again, Todd touched on and you know, has been done by his, his lab and collaborators in the field. I am not a basic scientist, I'm a clinical trialist. So I can only kind of build on the foundations um, that my expert colleagues provide me. And really, we all bring our expertise together to then figure out how do we translate what we know about this disease from our lab work to engage our industry partners for drug selection and come up with really novel, thoughtful trials to help these patients. And so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, um, but just high level, I want to make it clear again that what Todd said is very true and that there's multiple different pathways that we know are active and potentially in different compartments of craniopharyngioma. And when I say a pathway, I mean some sort of molecular signaling uh, um, pathway that turns on cells in the body to divide and grow. And that is at the essence of a tumor. But we're fortunate in that these pathways that have been identified, the PDL1 and PD1 pathway, the RASP, and RAF MAP kinase pathway that have been shown to be active in craniopharyngioma are actually targetable with commercially available agents. So our job then is to figure out how we can bring these agents together to treat these tumors, to target the pathways that we know are active in them, and to do so ideally in a combinatorial approach that we're hitting all parts of the active tumor that we know contain these pathway components. And so some of the work here just really highlights, it's a lot of um, really elegant efforts that have highlighted these pathways that are present in the tumor, where they are present in the tumor. And then in this lower right-hand corner, this is a drug called tretinib. What happens when we give drugs that target these pathways in the tumor? And this um, curve on the lower right-hand side is specifically showing that we can cause cell death and we can effectively treat these tumors by targeting these pathways. And so that work that was done that I showed on the previous slide really led us to start to brainstorm a couple years ago. Okay, we know these pathways are active. We know we have drugs for them. So how can we start to come up with a clinical trial to target it? And what was um, happening in parallel is that colleagues here at the Children's Brain Tumor Network at CHOP we're combining with a group called CPTAC, which is a group of proteomics experts that look at the levels of proteomic or protein activity um, in tumors to perform what we call a multi-omics profiling. So looking at genetics, looking at proteomics um, and profiling a number of pediatric brain tumors. And what was exciting was that they were able to include 16 patients with craniopharyngioma, which is a small sample size. Um, but it was still wonderful to see that even in this rare subpopulation of tumors, 
they were being pulled into these larger multi-omics um, profiling efforts in ways that haven't been previously done before. And so this group used things called whole genome sequencing, where they look at all the DNA in the cell. They used RNA sequencing, where they look at the RNA in the cell, and then they looked at the proteins in the cell. And what was interesting is that they found in adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma, which we have previously not necessarily thought of as an entity where there might be more than one subtype, they actually found that by looking at all of this profiling, particularly the protein profiles, that there are actually apparently two subtypes, even within the adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma population, where some of the tumors seem to really, really be driven and, and what we call segregate or kind of co-populate um, um, groups of tumors that are driven by this ras raf pathway again, okay? And what we found is that that happens even without the traditional DNA level markers that we usually look for to identify the activity of these pathways. And so specifically, we know that adults with papillary craniopharyngioma very commonly have what's called this BRAF V600E molecular marker. But what our colleagues through CBTN and CPTAC found was that even without that DNA marker, there are populations of craniopharyngioma patients, even in the pediatric setting, that their tumors seem to behave and align with that same type of driver pattern or molecular driver pattern. So that was really exciting to us. and really indicated that building on what our colleagues' work showed that the MAP kinase and the RAS and the RAF pathway is active in these tumors, that they, we also see that they tend to behave and kind of co-populate the same um, populations as tumors that have the same DNA markers that indicate a RAS and RAF MAP kinase pathway. So this story was really beautifully coming together to just further bolster and support that this is a targetable pathway and a pathway worth investigating in this tumor. And then similarly, I don't show here, but the same group also looked at the inflammatory and the immune pathway components of this tumor and really identified the PD-1 and pd one pathway as well to be very active. So again, this is work that's being done by multiple different groups, multiple different labs, multiple different ways of looking at the tumor, all pointing to kind of a same, the same direction. And that's really the goal of what we want um, when we're trying to figure out what is going to give us the most likely benefit um, is that we're finding multiple groups, multiple efforts are kind of pointing in the same direction. And so what we then turned to was figuring out what drugs do we, do we utilize to target these pathways. And we were fortunate that, as I said, we had commercial agents that could target PD-1 pathways. We have commercial agents that can target RAS and MAP kinase pathways. And what was exciting was that other groups had looked at these combinations in different types of tumors already and had demonstrated that they seemed to be tolerable, they seemed to be safe. And what was perhaps more exciting is that when you bring them together, they might have additive or synergistic benefit. And so some of the work that had been done in other tumor types, cancers like melanoma and colon cancer, for instance, they started to look at what happens when you treat either the tumors in the lab with this combinatorial strategy or look at the tumor cells after this combinatorial strategy. And what they found was that when you give RAS and RAFMAP kinase pathway inhibitors, you can actually see increases in immune infiltration and T cell markers in the tumors. Why is that exciting? because PD-1 inhibitors work by telling the tumor cell, or I should say blocking the tumor cell from turning off the immune system by preventing turning off of T cells. So what we know is that tumor cells have gotten very good at circumventing the body's own immune system from attacking it and killing those cancer cells and killing those tumor cells. So what we found here is that the ras raf MAP kinase pathway is targetable. We can give it to tumors and increase immune infiltration. And then we can give PD-1 inhibitors, which are also good targeted agents for this type of tumor, and perhaps increase the immune response in the tumor 
even beyond if we gave these drugs independently. And so that really even made us further excited about bringing this combination to patients and hopefully finding therapies that were less invasive than surgeries and radiation and that could effectively treat these diseases in a multi-compartment synergistic or additive way. And so from this work, um, Todd gave a bit of an, an overview, but as he said, we've now been able to collaborate with colleagues at day one therapeutics um, and then uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. So day one therapeutics has a drug called tovarafenib, which is what's called a panraf inhibitor. So what that means is that in the pathways, the RAS, RAP, MAP kinase pathways, there's a lot of different steps. So as a pathway indicates, that's exactly right. There's multiple steps along that pathway and each one triggers the next. And so what can happen is you can have inhibitors that are specific to one step. So you turn it off here, you turn it off here, you turn it off here, let's say. But a pan -rap inhibitor effectively shuts down multiple steps. So hopefully shutting down that entire pathway, which is fantastic because we don't want these tumors to figure out ways to turn on the pathway downstream or diff and if, if something is um, blocking it only at one step to find out another step that they can turn on. And then additionally, the nivolumab agent was um, is being provided in collaboration with Bristol Myers Squibb and both companies were in agreement that and motivated to allow us to bring the drugs together based on the work that I just showed you. And so what we had a lot of dialogue with colleagues about was that historically, um, these types of trials are really designed for once the tumor has come back or regrown, um, recurred, progressed, however you want to define it. But we really, really felt that even our patients with newly diagnosed disease were um, lacking um, effective therapies that could potentially help them avoid aggressive surgeries or radiation, which we know are helpful, but can cause injury to surrounding normal tissue. And so we really advocated that we wanted to make this trial available for newly diagnosed patients as well as recurrent patients. And so our trial will have two arms, it has a newly diagnosed arm and a recurrent arm. And what that means is that patients with new diagnosed cran craniopharyngioma will be eligible. And um, what we're doing now is we're enrolling them in what's called a treat biopsy treat approach. What that means is that when a patient comes in with craniopharyngioma on imaging or what looks to be craniopharyngioma on imaging, we, we know they will need surgery, whether it be a biopsy, a cyst drainage with biopsy or a surgical resection. But what we want to know is if we give these agents, how does that biologically change the tumor or how does that actually affect the pathways that we're hoping to stop or shut down? So what we propose is that for patients that it's safe to do so, we won't necessarily rush into the surgery, but we'll give them the medications first and then we'll go to surgery and we'll collect tissue then that will allow us to look at the tissue after they've gotten the drugs and identify what's happening in the tissue. How are these drugs working? How are they not working? And ideally use that information then to figure out if these drugs don't work, why and how did they not work? And what do we need to do to more effectively use them in the future? And so for the trial, patients will get randomized to either one dose of nivolumab, one dose of tovarafenib, or a dose of combination therapy before they get their surgery. And then they'll go to surgery and the surgeons will perform whatever their standard of care approach is. So if they think they can get the whole tumor out, they can do that. If they think they can only do a biopsy, they can do that. Um, but the patients that have leftover tissue after the surgery, they'll continue on the trial afterwards and they'll continue the combination strategy with the nivolumab and the tovarafenib as long as they continue to see clinical benefit, it's safe to do so, and that they don't have tumors that progress through the therapy. If the patients get the tumor completely removed by the surgery, they will stay on the study but we'll continue to follow them only through the follow-up um, uh, exploratory aims and secondary aims. They won't continue to get therapy, um, but we wanna see how these patients still do long-term so they won't come off study completely. And very similarly, in the recurrent arm, we'll follow the same approach. 
a patient has a tumor that grows back or recurs after surgery or radiation or whatever therapy they've gotten before, they will come into the trial. They'll get randomized. They'll ideally go forward with a surgical intervention, whether that be removing more tumor, draining a cyst with a possible biopsy, or taking the tumor out full. And then afterwards, they'll follow the same pipeline in terms of if they have leftover tissue, they'll continue on combination strategy. If they have no leftover tissue, they'll continue in follow up. We do recognize, though, that some patients with recurrent craniopharyngioma don't necessarily need a second surgery. Okay. And, or the surgeons and the team members may say it's not safe to go in and do that second surgery. And we didn't want to exclude this patient population from this therapeutic option. We really wanted to design this such that any patient that potentially needed therapy for their craniopharyngioma would have a space in this trial. And so for those patients, though, that do not need a repeat surgery or it's not indicated, we will still allow them to enroll in the trial in an exploratory cohort. And so we don't get that on study tumor tissue collection, but we will require that they have some tumor left over from a previous surgery so that we still have that biologic information that we can utilize and we can still look at markers in what their original tumor looked like to, again, kind of figure out if there's predictors or biomarkers of why these patients did or didn't respond, what are those biomarkers and how can we use that moving forward as we develop the next iterations of these trials? So. What are the primary endpoints and how will we define success in our trial? What we're utilizing is not only can we control the tumor, but can we control the tumor and also maintain patients' quality of life throughout the trial, okay? So at 12 months on the trial, we're gonna be looking not only at has the tumor been effectively controlled, but also are the patients living the best life they can live still? So we're going to collect quality of life assessments throughout the trial, starting at the very, very beginning before they've even gotten any medications. And if a patient has control of their tumor, but their quality of life has fallen substantially over the course of that therapy, we're going to say that that was a fails approach. Because our goal for these patients, we know we're fortunate that they have very long survival with this tumor. But what we also know is that their quality of life as Todd highlighted, as many have highlighted, is exceedingly impacted by their diagnosis. So our goal above any health is to find therapies that both control the tumor and slow the tumor growth down or stop it completely, but also maintain that patients are able to live the best quality of life that they can. So we've brought these two together in a composite endpoint, and we'll need both to declare this trial a success. The other pieces of information, as I talked about, when I entered into the, the slide deck with um, a summary page of all of the multidisciplinary team members that are involved is that we really want to identify not just the safety of this combination, but we want to look at what are the visual outcomes for these patients that are so impacted from an ophthalmologic standpoint by this disease and the treatments we give. And also, what are the neuroendocrine outcomes? Because we know that that has an imperative impact on patients' quality of life. Okay, so we will be looking at all of these things in serial, at serial time points throughout the trial. And so we can track, are we improving these things? Are we at least maintaining stability or are patients still having negative impacts on these outcomes, which are critical to these patients? And then lastly, so as I said, the biology of these tumors has been so important for helping us develop new ways to treat them and also will continue to help us develop new ways to treat them, okay? And so with Todd's help, with other biologic or um, basic science collaborators that study the biology of these tumors, so many of the names which Todd um, mentioned, uh, but across the globe, really, we're utilizing workflows and pipelines that they have already developed to look at these tumors and explore the pathways in these tumors. We're capitalizing on these opportunities to contribute tumor tissue, contribute other biologic specimens. So from our, within our trial, we're collecting cyst fluid, tumor tissue, stool, because we know there's evolving evidence, particularly in the setting of immune therapy responses um, for the, the role of the microbiome in therapy responses, and blood, 
because we also want to look at various biomarkers in blood. And so when patients enter the trial, we are thoughtfully collecting all of these biological specimens longitudinally over the course of the trial. And we'll be using a lot of these high level um, scientific workflows and um, advanced um, investigational opportunities to identify how is the, the molecular pathways, immune pathways, inflammatory pathways of these tumors changing, evolving, developing mechanisms of response or resistance. And additionally, where we have really lacked in this field as well is many of our pediatric tumors have gained success by creation and by utilization of what we call preclinical models, whether that be what's called cell lines or animal models in the clinic. We've really struggled over the years creating effective craniopharyngioma models. But I think with the work of multiple collaborators, including Todd's lab, I think we're finally coming up with effective ways to develop these preclinical models. And now we're coming together as a group to make sure our efforts are complementary and that we're subsequently utilizing these models to test new therapies and test new drugs in thoughtful ways. And we'll be utilizing tissue from these, um, from these uh, clinical trials to create and develop further, further models. So I will stop there. I think I'm at time. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much to everyone that's contributed to this work, the patients, the families, the multiple, multiple consortia, um, the Raymond E. Wood Foundation for their unending support of what we've done. And for also their just incredible insight from a patient and family's perspective. Um, certainly collaborators throughout PNUC, CBTN, Todd's group, ATPC, um, and beyond. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cassie, for this so exciting information. Um, and again, we'll take questions at the end. Um, up next, we have Julia Crowley. Um, Dr. Crowley is a pediatric endocrinology fellow at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She is a graduate of William and Mary and Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. She is doing research on the use and impact of growth hormone on craniopharyngioma, and she is leading an upcoming observational study looking at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in patients with craniopharyngioma. Um, okay, and I am going to attempt to share the PowerPoint. <laughs> Let's see. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction and for helping me share my slides. Let me see if I can get it in the right mode. <laughs> How's that? Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so nice to meet you all. Um, I'm going to be talking today about um, our upcoming study looking for fatty liver disease and survivors of pediatric craniopharyngioma. I'm going to be doing this study with um, Dr. Shana McCormick, who is the PI, but I also want to acknowledge we have a large team of investigators who have helped us plan this study, including Dr. Cassie Pine, who we just heard from in neuroncology, also radiology, and um, our gastroenterology colleagues here at CHOP. Um, next slide, please. So to start off um, with some basics, what is fatty liver disease? Um, it is when there's too much fat stored in the liver cells, and this can lead to scarring in the liver, um, which is called cirrhosis and is shown here at the bottom. And this can be serious because it is the leading cause of liver transplantation, which is something we want to prevent. Um, we think that fatty liver disease is related to um, other weight-related conditions, such as type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure. It's also difficult to diagnose using blood work, which is the current way that we screen for this in our patients. So why do this study in our population? So we know that having extra weight is a risk factor for fatty liver disease, but also hypopituitarism, especially if not fully treated, is also a risk factor for fatty liver disease. So we think that the combination of excess weight and hypopituitarism could lead to higher rates of fatty liver disease and could potentially make it worse. Um, we also think that we could potentially be missing fatty liver disease in our patients because screening for it on blood work is um, so problematic. Um, next slide, please. So um, who can participate in our study? So hopefully you or your child, if you qualify, 
Um, we will be recruiting individuals with history of craniopharyngioma between the ages of six and 17 years old. Um, they must be able to lie still for an MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging of the abdomen, uh, which can take about 30 minutes to one hour. And then we'll also be recruiting healthy individuals without history of craniopharyngioma for comparison. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what would you have to do for our study? So our study is an observational study, so it's distinct from an interventional trial. Right now, we don't know the exact number of people who are affected with both craniopharyngioma and fatty liver disease. So we want to do this study to simply observe who is affected. Um, so for our study, you would come here to CHOP. You would get a physical exam and vital signs. Um, you would do an MRI of your liver. So similar technology to the MRI brain, just of your abdomen. And you can see a picture here of a liver on MRI. Um, of note, we will not be using contrast and we won't use sedation for the MRI. We would also get morning um, blood work. We'd have you answer questions about your sleep and appetite on questionnaires. And then we would do a hand grip strength um, using that little device there. Um, we really want to describe who gets fatty liver disease, which is why we want to ask you about your sleep and appetite. We want to look at your metabolism based off the morning blood work. And we want to look at your activity and your muscle strength using the hand grip strength um, test. If we do diagnose you with fatty liver disease on this study, we'll promptly refer you to our gastroenterologist. We have um, a, gastroenter a gastroenterologist who specializes in fatty liver here at CHOP and she helped us plan this study. So we would promptly refer you to an expert so you could get the care that you need. Uh, we think this can all be done in one day, but if it's more convenient to do it in two days, that's possible as well. Um, next slide, please. So what next for our study? So we hope to conduct a larger study in the future so we can fully compare those who have craniopharyngioma and those who do not, who do not and their risk. Um, we also hope that this may lead to better screening practices for fatty liver disease. Um, and we hope that this uh, may lead to better treatments in the future as well. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about our study or even participating, you can email me um, at crowleyj1 at chop.edu. Um, on the bottom is a picture of an MRI, and then um, we have our Burger Center, which is the building you'll you would come to for the study. Um, and thanks so much for having me and for helping me with the slides, Amy. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Okay, um, so just a reminder, you can post your questions in the chat. Um, if you'd like to ask your question directly, I'm gonna do my best to scan the group and see if anyone has their hand raised. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, so first of all, um, I think this question was geared towards uh, Dr. Hankinson, but I think anyone could kind of take this. Um, Sue says uh, her 16-year-old son was diagnosed with craniopharyngioma in late December of last year. He had surgery um, at DeVos in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with left him with vision issues and pituitary and hypothalamic um, complications. They worked with uh, Dr. Merchant at St. Jude, where he received proton radiation. Um, scans are stable six months out. Um, but they're motivated to do anything possible towards bettering um, quality of life. Is there any um, anything you could recommend um, where they could pursue more answers, more information, more advancements, get medication reviews, any strategies? Um, they're willing to travel anywhere. Um, yeah, so thanks for, for asking that question. I guess what I would say is, you know, St. Jude is an outstanding, outstanding institution with tons of resources and experience and infrastructure. So I would be really hesitant to um, like step in and say, hey, you should, do, you should be doing something different or missing something. I guess my only question would be whether or not you guys are also connected with endocrinology and ophthalmology and all those other subspecialties, which, you know, Cassie really highlighted, because that's really critical to overall quality of life, especially over the long term and having some contacts um, locally or, or, you know, maybe not so much 
who are specifically looking at those things is really critical. St. Jude's had St. Jude has those resources, but um, we work with them a lot uh, with patients and stuff like that um, who have specific needs or, or you know locations. So I would say there are a number of institutions that are really great and have a ton of experience. St. Jude is definitely one of them. Um, and you know, I know Cassie's group does this. We do a lot of second opinions remotely and stuff like that too. But um, usually, what we're doing is kind of confirming that that what they're doing somewhere else is what we would do too. Thank you. Is there anyone want to add to that? Okay. Um, just echo, just echo oh. it. I, that's that's the only important part is making sure you're getting all the multidisciplinary care that you need. So. Thank you. If a child has had surgery to remove the tumor and then proton to treat regrowth, would they qualify for the trial, the, either trial if the tumor regrows? And that's from Eileen. So for the CONNECT trials, yeah, the answer is yes. If there's tumor regrowth and measurable disease, then you um, that child would qualify in the post-radiation stratum. So absolutely. Um, and I think that that's true too, Cassie, right, for peanut study. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, so Dr. Hankinson stated that craniofrangioma could expand the blood brain barrier enough to potentially let some larger molecules through. Our daughter got my viral meningitis a few months ago prior to diagnosis. Her tumor was quite large at that point. Is there any correlation with this large with this larger virus having gotten through the barrier due to the craniofrangioma? She's also, it's uh, Eva's asking, she's also asking, has anyone else had meningitis during a cranio? Um, I can certainly speak to the biological question there. Um, I didn't get into the details, but the short answer is that the viral infection almost certainly is not related to the craniopharyngioma. The, the reason what made us sort of think that the blood-brain barrier may be compromised with craniopharyngioma was uh, an understanding of where we think the tumors arise from and they come from an area they're believed to come from an area around the pituitary gland that actually doesn't have a blood-brain barrier and it has to do with facilitating hormone transport from um, signals in the brain into the actual body where those hormones are are active and so we thought that it stood to reason that maybe if cranial arises in an area that lacks a fully intact blood brain barrier, that it may be accessible to drugs that that don't cross. And so it's not so much that the tumor damages or, or weakens the blood brain barrier. It's just that it arises in a place where we think maybe there isn't one. And um, and that's where that comes from. Thank you. Um, Question, my daughter has an ACP with non-VRAP uh, V600E mutation. What seems to be the most promising trial to date to help with this tumor's recurrence? Um, all, all three of the trials that we really talked about today are targeted towards those tumors specifically. The um, the papillary cranios that are really consistently known to have the BRAF V600E mutation are sort of a different entity at the moment in terms of clinical trials, and there are specific drugs and trials for those. We've been really talking today about the adamantinomatous ones, and those are the ones that 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 almost exclusively don't harbor a BRAF V600E mutation and do harbor what's called a CTNNB1 mutation. Um, so yeah, all three of these trials would be relevant. Great, thank you. Um, we have, hold on, we just got away from me. Um, Okay, just wondering if information is ever shared with tumor samples that are sent to the consortium for research. Wondering if families can ever learn anything that is remarkable by the tumor to help identify it and provide guidance to post-op damaging effects. Um, yeah, I keep answering partially because I know Cassie's got really bad laryngitis, but so, <laughs> like, I don't want it to seem like I feel like I have to answer all these questions, but yeah. definitely Hi. if you had to say something different, do it. Um, so by and large, th that's a, that's an interesting question. It's a little bit mixed. Um, sometimes the studies we do, we actually, um, will not necessarily be looking at the clinical characteristics of the patient when we do it. So like when we derive cell lines and things like that, we don't necessarily do that. Generally, we we don't double back and share stuff as a matter of practice, but certainly if something like unique came out, like we found some potentially impactful genetic thing, we would let families know. 
And a lot of the time, just as a matter of sort of talking about how things are evolving and what's happening, we do as well. But we have not had a situation where we found something in the lab that would be a totally unique, different, lead to a unique or different therapy or a different risk than we had already discussed for the, you know, with the patient and family of just having craniopharyngioma. Um, that's not like the best answer to that question, I don't think, but, but that's kind of. Yeah. yeah. No, the only other thing I'll add is that sometimes a lot of the work, you know, we collect the samples and we kind of do them in bulk, like later on as well. Um, and so some of the discovery happens too, like after the patients or families have gotten treatment. So I'll only echo what, you know, Todd says in terms of the various labs we collaborate with within our consortium. And then um, certainly within the Children's Brain Tumor Network, we're very avid in terms of making tissue um, donations to that group as well. And, you know, if there is a, um, a pathway to notify a family, if there is something that is critically um, important that we find kind of on a, a research basis that we have to feed back to families, um, kind of depending on how the study and the consent is designed, we'll, we'll, might do that. But um, a lot of the work too, at least within CBTN, um, is going towards NIH supported databases as well. So all of our biologic specimens collected on our trials informs um, larger central nervous system tumor databases like PHC BioPortal that are able to be utilized um, and by parents and by researchers alike. Um, so you may not necessarily um, find your exact child, but um, kind of in an aggregate way, you can see how your, your child's um, biologic specimen is being utilized to, to improve therapies, if, that, if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, for Julia, is it is it possible that um, they could ask for an MRI of the liver when um, their child has a regular MRI to check on tumor growth for your study? That's um, a great question. So as, as of now, we don't recommend routine MRIs to look for this. If you have high liver enzymes, so specifically an ALT, then your doctor may prompt a further workup, but we, we wonder with our study if we can really detect people who have it and maybe come up with some risk factors that might prompt earlier um, imaging for those who are, are at high risk. But as of now, we don't recommend routine MRI. Okay, um, Nicole has her hand raised. I'm gonna go ahead and let her ask her question. Thanks. Um, I was going to try a bit, and then I'm like, no, it's easier to ask. Mm -hmm. So I have, um, there's been, it's, if I remember from last year, there was kind of some data around, you know, the average, you know, recurrence after radiation or something was, you know, after five years is the average, but the average is kind of hard to tell, right? So I'm wondering if there's any data around like maybe like a median, you know, and then uh, that was my first question. Then my second question is, with all of this, do you recommend doing any of this stuff kind of preemptively? Because right now we're super fortunate that we don't see, um, everything's kind of stable and it's been that way for about 18 months. But um, do you wait for there to be like a recurrence and for there to be like a intervention is necessary type thing? Or is this something that you would think about ahead of time? So usually, um, so to answer your second question first, the reason that we usually wait for a recurrence and, and we're not proactive is twofold. Number one is the treatments themselves are have their own morbidities associated with them. And really the only thing historically we would have been talking about is radiation. Um, so because if there's no tumor there, there's nothing to do surgery on. And if the only other option was radiation, then you'd be talking about doing sort of prophylactic radiation. And that obviously comes with its own consequences. And so we have not done that. Um, as we develop new therapies and things, even though the idea is that those just as or more effectively treat the tumor with lower toxicity, there's still going to be some issues that come with those. All of those drugs have some side effects in addition to just the standard difficulty of being on a medication. Excuse me. So with these by and large, we probably would not treat if someone had, for example, like no tumor or tumor that wasn't growing at all. Um, but I guess stay tuned because depending upon how how trials go in the future, that those algorithms can always change. 
Um, your first question was about median time to radiation failure. Is that kind of what you were asking? Yeah, it, seemed, it just seems kind of, um, and I don't know, maybe this is me just like thinking too, thinking too, uh, I don't know, too math about it. But it just, you, you always kind of say like, oh, five years, but then you hear stories about, you know, coming back after yeah. one year and then coming back after 10 years. And so it's like, maybe the average isn't the best metric to use for this particular tumor. But I don't know if there's other yeah. metrics that maybe other folks are using. So, so Cassie may be able to speak more intelligently about this than than I can. But I guess what I would say is, um, with with slow growing sort of you know um, benign tumors, you can run into recurrences that happen in a really delayed fashion, and so you have this sort of wide band. If you can have a recurrence that happens really fast, although after radiation, oftentimes if it's a cystic recurrence we feel like the effect of the radiation doesn't actually kick in for six to even 12 months. So sometimes cyst growth during that really short window isn't even considered a failure of the radiation. It's just part of the process. And that can be one of the tricky things we deal with. Um, but you can really just have a wide range of when it happens. And so that's why it's a, it's a little tricky in any given patient and you sort of estimate. And I think, a, you know, mathematically a median is nice because you do have sort of a, a tail on either end. Um, but yeah, um just, oh sorry yeah here no go ahead Cassie. no i mean i was just going to comment so when we look at our um nicole to your point from a biostatistical standpoint for the clinical trials we only look at median so we do things by looking at the proportion of patients that have had something at certain intervals commonly so it's going to be like how like what proportion had the tumor recur at one month I'm sorry, 12 months, you know, two years, three years, five years. But then you're absolutely right. When we're looking at the med the progression free survival, like how many months or the overall survival, that's always the median. You're, and that is exactly right to accommodate kind of, you know, the exceptional outliers on either end. Um, and so when we say kind of um, when we're utilizing most statistics, it is actually the median or like a proportion, if that helps clarify things. Yeah, I just, I, I don't remember there ever being that information that's ever been shared, I guess, or that I haven't seen. Well, like one thing that I think we need to do a lot better job with, and like I've kind of, we've been working on it in fits and starts, is creating a web based resource for patients and families that they can use for this exact kind of thing where, you know, you can log on to it and see a lot more about what trials are there, what the outcomes are, what our standards are, what resources are, you know, websites about, um, you know, what can I expect? What doctors do I need to see? And I, I have had trouble finding a really good resource for that. Um, and, and we've talked about trying to stand one up and like, we'll make progress and then kind of get delayed because I'm really slow. Um, and, but that's a, I think something that could really help with questions like this one, which are questions that everybody has and, and are, we should do a better job answering them. Well, we have good news on that front. We are working on that type of project. And then we also have the clinical trials listed on our website as well with, um, pretty comprehensive data. So please check that out, rawoodfoundation.org. We know there are many more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. So we'll curate, curate those questions offline and work to get them answered for you guys. Um, Dr. Klein, Dr. Hankinson, Dr. Kelly, thank you so, so much for sharing this information with us. This is all very exciting and um, we look forward to hearing more. Um, up next, we are gonna learn how to do our own research with Dr. Alter. So we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Thank you.